Uh, welcome to Killed for Fashion, How to Help End Fur Farming in the U.S. Uh, we'd love to know who's joining us today, so please take a moment to put your name and where you're located into the chat, and we'll get started in just a minute. Okay, let's get started. Thank you so much for being here uh, to learn more about exciting policy developments to end the fur farming industry at both the local and federal level, as well as how you can help animals suffering for fashion. So as a heads up, I'll be providing uh, brief descriptions of what you see, of what's on your screen for those who can't see it well. And on this slide is a photo of two minks trapped in a cage on a fur farm. And I'm Liz Cabrera-Holtz. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a woman in my late 30s. And I'm the Senior Campaigns Manager at World Animal Protection US. I wanna take a moment to introduce you to World Animal Protection if you're new. World Animal Protection is a global nonprofit organization that exposes destructive, exploitative, and cruel systems and provides practical and achievable solutions. We focus on protecting animals in the wild and in farming. Our mission is to move the world to protect animals. And our vision is a world where animals live free from suffering. Animals killed for their fur are confined to crowded, dirty cages for their entire lives. They suffer from the moment they're born until their premature deaths. But we're close to shutting down the fur industry in part thanks to our two wonderful speakers. First, Kate Delewski is the Assistant Director of Government Affairs at the Animal Welfare Institute. She previously worked at Born Free USA and for the past decade has lobbied at the federal and state levels on issues pertaining to wildlife. Since joining AWI, she has been closely involved with efforts to protect the Endangered Species Act from congressional and regulatory assaults, led coalitions advocating for federal bills to protect wild animals in captivity, and partnered with organizations across the country to push state legislation addressing performing wild animals, wildlife trafficking, and trapping, among other issues. Kate holds a BA from Georgetown University and a Master of Public Administration from American University and lives in Washington, D.C. with her three cats. Max Broad is the founder of D.C. Voters for Animals, a nonprofit political advocacy organization that lifts up the policies and politicians doing the most for animals in DC. His background is in climate policy, having previously worked for the National Wildlife Federation and as a bioenergy consultant at the US Department of Energy. Max has a master's in environmental science and management from UC Santa Barbara and a BA from UC Irvine. Uh, so there'll be some time uh, at the end for questions. As the speakers present, please add your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, you can add questions to the chat, but uh, we may miss them there. But before I turn it over to our speakers, I'm going to give you a bit of background on all the animals or most of the animals suffering in the fashion industry generally. So please know that this isn't exhaustive. For example, I'm going to skip over issues like wool and down. Every year, millions of animals are caged, abused, hunted, and killed for their skin, fur, and feathers to be used in fashion uh, for clothing and accessories. Some of the animals who are suffering the most include minks and raccoon dogs for their fur, crocodiles and cows for their skin, uh, and ostriches and peacocks uh, for their decorative feathers. And on the screen, you'll see a photo of a fashion show and then the bodies of dead foxes who were killed for their fur. This is a photo of a mink sitting in a typical cage on a fur farm. Animals killed for their fur like minks are confined to these cages their entire lives. They're unable to engage in their most basic natural behaviors. Minks are wild animals. They're semi-aquatic, they're solitary, but on fur farms, they're crammed into these cages with many other animals they're unable to swim and explore. So unsurprisingly, this causes extreme distress and many minks engage in self-mutilation, self um, such as biting their feet and tails um, and obsessively pacing. 
The methods to kill animals for their fur um, are also very painful. It's designed to protect the quality of the fur uh, without regard for the welfare of the animal. So animals are suffocated, electrocuted, gassed, poisoned, sometimes skinned alive, um, or their necks are broken. In terms of skins, I'm referring to when animals like crocodiles and lizards and cows and goats are skinned for leather boots, jackets, purses, wallets, items like that. Unfortunately, crocodile farming is on the rise. Um, every year, thousands of Australian crocodiles live a short, unhappy life before being killed for their skin. To make just a single luxury handbag for the French fashion brand Hermes, four crocodiles are killed. So in the wild, saltwater crocodiles live, uh, they can live for more than 70 years, but on farms, they're only allowed to live for about three years and they're kept in these small, barren, plastic lined pens like you see on your screen. My colleagues at World Animal Protection in Australia have done a lot of work on this issue. So I've included one of their photos, um, a photo of one of their protests outside an Hermes store. Turning to cows, um, cow leather is not merely a byproduct of the meat and dairy industry, but it's rather a quote unquote co-product. It's a for-profit business. So creating leather is water intensive, it pollutes waterways, and leather is tanned with dangerous cancer-causing chemicals, with obviously serious repercussions for workers and neighboring communities. As Collective Fashion Justice, whose series um, Under Their Skin, a report series on the injustices of leather production I've included in my slide, um, points out leather sales effectively subsidize beef production meaning leather props up the destructive meat industry. Finally, though less prolific than furs and skins, decorative feathers are still used frequently in fashion um, as adornments to hats or even to create uh, dresses and skirts. For decorative feathers, ostriches are the most commonly exploited bird, which is why I've included a photo of a group of ostriches. Uh, in addition to feathers, the fashion industry uses ostriches skin, um, like in designer bags and wallets. There are very few legal protections for um, ostriches confined on farms, uh, the majority of which uh, are in South Africa. Investigations of ostrich farms in South Africa revealed birds engaged in repetitive behaviors and displaying other signs of psychological distress. Ostriches are sent to slaughterhouses um, where they're stunned with a captive bolt gun or electrically. Um, they're shackled, hung upside down, and bled out. So much like with the fur industry, a tremendous amount of suffering goes into extracting feathers uh, from birds for fashion. So that was a rather grim rundown of, of what's happening with fashion and animals, but I just wanted to give you that larger context before we move to fur, which is so often um, the focus of, of animal protection. And while the subject matter of fur farming is also quite difficult, um, I think there's so much movement in this area, and I'm really hopeful for the future, especially when we have people like Kate and Max who are taking it on. So with that, I'm going to invite Kate, uh, invite Kate on screen and pass it over to her. Thanks so much, Liz. Hi, I'm really happy to be here with all of you today. Um, I'm going to follow up that great rundown from Liz about the cruelty that is inherent in the fur and other fashion industries that exploit animals with a discussion of how this issue also crosses over into the public health sphere. Um, specifically, I want to talk about the public health threats of mink fur farming. Next slide. So... Mink on these fur farms, as Liz mentioned, are confined in really crowded environments and um, you know cages that are stacked on top of one another. And this creates an ideal environment for pathogens on these farms to circulate among the mink to um, create a reservoir for diseases where they can mutate into new forms. Um, but that is not the only risk inherent in mink farms in particular. Um, in addition to the environment that they're housed in, mink also have an interesting biological feature. And that is that mink lungs are very similar to human lungs. They have receptors in the same spots in their upper respiratory tracts. 
And this physiological similarity means that they pose an additional risk to humans in terms of their ability to be what scientists call mixing vessels for potentially deadly respiratory viruses. Um, they can catch respiratory diseases both from humans and from other species. And on these crowded farms, as they transmit the virus, um, the virus can actually recombine within the mink into forms that are well adapted to mink lungs and therefore also potentially very well adapted to human lungs. Uh, I wanted to include this quote from a recent journal article that shed light on this issue where the scientists said, quote, we strongly urge governments to consider the mounting evidence suggesting that fur farming, particularly mink, be eliminated in the interest of pandemic preparedness. Next slide. So uh, we saw this propensity among mink in fur farms in a particularly um, dangerous way in the COVID pandemic. In 2020, in peak lockdown, when we were facing the worst of this pandemic, all of a sudden we started to see reports of massive COVID-19 outbreaks on mink fur farms. This started over in Europe, and then it happened here in the United States, also in Canada. And ultimately there were outbreaks on more than 480 known mink fur farms across 12 countries. And this resulted in millions of mink becoming infected and millions dying either from the disease itself or from being killed to prevent its spread. And while this was you know, a shocking outbreak all on its own, the other very alarming aspect of it was that we then saw evidence in at least six countries that mink could actually pass a mutated form of the virus back to humans. Um, we saw farm workers on these farms come down with COVID that when tested had markers that were very specific to the mink. And so this uh, ability to produce variants is something that unfortunately we know is a real danger, something that can prolong the pandemic, can undermine uh, the efficacy of vaccines and can pose a real threat, not only to these mink populations, but also to uh, humans' ability to deal with this ongoing pandemic threat. Next slide. And unfortunately, this threat does not end with COVID-19. Um, it also has to do with our preparedness for the potential of future pandemics. Um, so there is a strain of avian influenza that has been circulating, circulating the globe for the past few years in bird populations, um, both in domestic livestock poultry farms um, and also in wild bird populations. Uh, this strain is, to, uh, scientists call it H5N1. And it has been absolutely deadly to birds, um, but for right now, it's not something that has mutated in a way to be able for a human who catches it from a bird to transmit it to other humans. So the overall risk to humans at this moment is low. But what we have seen is that since fall of 2022, H5N1 has infected tens of thousands of mink on dozens of fur farms. And Right now, as we speak, there's an ongoing outbreak happening across fur farms in Finland. And like I said, mink are these really effective mixing vessels. And so there is this real fear that this virus could mutate in mink into a form that would be more dangerous to humans. And we've seen, you know, sort of movement towards that in the sense that on one of these mink farms, the H5N1 virus gained at least one mutation that favors mammal to mammal spread, allowing mink to pass it to each other instead of just catch it directly from birds. If that mutation were to um, you know, continue to develop in such a way that it was possible for humans to pass it to each other, we would be looking at a potential crisis. And scientists have been calling this H5N1 mink farm outbreak 
a clear mechanism for an H5 pandemic to start and a warning bell. Next slide. So as we have been digesting all this information about the public health ramifications of mink farming and trying to develop policy solutions to address it, um, we have also been taking into account the state of the mink farming industry. And so I just wanted to provide you with a quick snapshot of what that is. So mink farming uh, is an industry in decline. Even before the COVID outbreaks on mink farms, we were seeing this industry start to nosedive. And you can see that on this graph that was provided by USDA um, as a result of survey data that they have collected. And since about 2014, sales um, and prices of mink pelts have been dropping precipitously. And this has to do with the fact that fur is just not in fashion anymore. I don't personally know anyone going out and buying a mink coat. You probably don't either. It's just not something that is uh, that consumers want in the United States. That's thanks in large part to education campaigns, to work with uh, retailers and other fashion corporations to cut down on the amount of fur that's sold here. So this industry was already struggling. And then you add uh, the COVID outbreaks and the other public health fears on top of that and you have an industry that is not financially sustainable. Next slide. So taking all of that information together, we have worked with some amazing public health partners and also with other amazing organizations, including World Animal Protection, to come up with a federal bill to holistically address this problem and create a solution that will hopefully be a win for everybody. And that bill is called Mink Vectors for Infection Risk in the United States Act, or the Mink Virus Act. Um, this bill was introduced for the first time last year by Congressman Espayat from New York. It's H.R. 3783. And the bill would do two things. It would end the farming of mink for their fur after a one-year phase-out period. And it would establish a grant program within the U.S. Department of Agriculture to reimburse mink farmers for the full value of their farm. So this would eliminate the risk to public health posed by mink farming in the United States. And it would also provide mink farmers in this nose diving industry with an off ramp uh, with the resources that they would need to transition to another industry, one that is hopefully more financially sustainable and less dangerous. So it's very early days with this bill, um, we are still working to get momentum and endorsements and co-sponsors, and you can help us. Um, you can go to the link in the chat to take action on this bill, to send a message to your representative in Congress and ask them to please co-sponsor this bill um, because we wanna get it all the support that we possibly can. Next slide. And finally, I just wanted to touch on the international response to these disease outbreaks on mink farms to show that the Mink Virus Act is in many ways very closely aligned with what other nations have already done. So you can see this list of countries, mostly in Europe, um, that have banned or are in the process of banning mink farming. Some of these countries had already banned it before COVID. Some of them uh, sped up the process of banning it during COVID in response to the outbreaks. Um, and some have implemented bans in response because uh, this public health threat is too great to ignore. Um, also uh, to point out two of them, Italy and the province of British Columbia in Canada are not only banning mink farming, but they're also providing financial support for mink farmers as they transition out of the industry. So that is the same model as our Federal Mink Virus Act. And finally, just wanted to note that in 2021, Israel became the first country to ban the sale of most fur products. So there has been a lot of international progress on this front. Next slide. So I'm happy to take any questions that you may have at the end of this webinar. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you so much, Kate. That was wonderful. And uh, up next, we are going to hear from Max Broad. 
Yeah, hi, so nice to be with all of you. Thank you for being on this webinar and you know, just a big thank you to World Animal Protection for convening us for this super important topic, something that I feel optimistic that we're gonna have a big win in in the near future. So let's talk about that. Uh, so my my name is Max Broad. I'm from DC Voters for Animals, which uh, I founded about five years ago almost. And we work on local level animal protection. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about DC Voters for Animals in the next slide, uh, just as background. Um, so DC Voters for Animals, we work to lift up the policies and politicians doing the most for animals in the District of Columbia. So a couple things about that. We are very positive focused, right? We're working to lift up policies and politicians. We're working to promote the folks trying to do good and we're trying to promote the best policies. And uh, and also take note that we're, we're working in the District of Columbia, right, DC. So we're working on very local level policy. That's DC council, that's mayor level, that's uh, city government officials. So that's the type of work we, we, we do. And note that we're a 501c4 organization. Uh, so for those of you not familiar, most charities are known as a 501c3, the, most of the charities that you're familiar with, which they have the benefit of, 501c3s have the benefit of getting tax deductible donations. The government in its tax code does not want to incentivize you as citizens, you as donors to give to organizations that conduct lobbying and that influence elections. So uh, organizations like mine that are 501c4s, we, we do not get tax deduct or the, the donors do not get tax deductions in exchange for that we are able to work on lobbying and elections so we campaign for candidates we endorse candidates we issue candidate questionnaires we hold candidate forums and things like that a lot of things that traditional charities are not able to do and i just want to give you all some background on the first policy work we worked on so uh, back in 2015 the humane society of the united states had worked with uh, a council member in DC council who's now retired to introduce the Elephant, Ivory and Rhinoceros Horn Protection Act. And this bill would ban the sale of ivory and rhino horn in DC. And the bill was introduced and since DC operates on the same cycle as Congress every two years, at the end of the, the two year session, the, the bill died. And since it wasn't passed, it had to be reintroduced the next year. So it was reintroduced in 2017. Again, referred to committee, died in committee. Again, reintroduced in 2019. And people are like, who is opposing this bill? Right? Like, is there some big ivory lobby in DC that's opposing this? And so as y'all know, we started in 2019. That's when we started poking around and seeing, well, what is going on here? Like, who is opposing this bill? Why is it not passing? And so we took a look at it and found out that it, there was no opposition. It just wasn't a priority. So it really lit a fire under us as animal advocates to step up and show our democratically elected leaders that this was a priority and that this needed to be passed. So we did things like we partook in a coalition of uh, to do lobby meetings. So we went and met with the legislators. We got together and did social media activism like tweet storms. We did calls and emails. And sure enough, that push was enough to get DC Council to pass the bill. And it was signed into law by summer of 2020. So next slide. So let, let's get to the heart of the story here on huh? the DC Fur Products Prohibition Act. So this is a bill that we have introduced in DC Council, we're really excited for, and it would be a sales ban on fur products, right? So DC would join the many uh, municipalities and jurisdictions that have passed DC, uh, that have passed sales bans on fur products. And so this would essentially be any, you know, any, any new product made from fur with exemptions for products that are used for religious purposes or secondhand fur. And we uh, we saw 10 of DC's 13 council members sign on in support of this bill. So really fantastic widespread support. Now you should know that in DC, we have no furriers left, okay? So of course this is kind of a new term for me because I was never shopping at fur stores myself, but furriers refer to stores that, that exclusively sell fur coats. We don't have any of those, which is awesome. However, we, we do still have a handful of stores that sell products made from fur. So, you know, that kind of put us in this really awesome sweet spot. 
where we we if this bill is passed, nobody's going to go out of business, right? So we don't have to have this conversation around about, about jobs and small businesses. But there are still companies and a lot of like major international global conglomerate companies that are selling fur in DC. And so there is still a reason for us to pass this bill. We're not going to be hit with the argument like, what does it even matter? This bill isn't going to make an impact. No, it is going to make an impact, both symbolically as the nation's capital and in terms of the stores that are still selling fur in Washington, DC. Boom. All right, next slide. So how, how do we get this bill introduced in the first place, right? Where, where is it coming from? And it's actually a really sweet and sad, but heartwarming story. So uh, in, in the first election that we engaged in in 2020, we put together a, a candidate questionnaire and we sent it to all the candidates running in DC's uh, DC council election. And one of the candidates, what we did was we compiled a lot of the priority issues that the community was feeling. And so of course, one of those questions was on fur and whether the candidates would support a ban on fur products. And one of the candidates came back with a uniquely wonderful response. And that was uh, DC's former mayor and now Ward 7 council member, Vincent Gray. And uh, council member Gray said he, he really wanted to support our, our efforts at DC Voters Families. And when we spoke with him, he especially called out fur. And, and we asked why fur was so important to him. And he shared with us that his late wife, Loretta, was a big animal advocate and her pet issue, so to speak, was uh, abolishing the cruel acts of the fur industry. So just like he 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 told us, I wanna be the one to, to champion this legislation for you in honor, in honor of my late wife, which I thought was so beautiful. And, you know, just a big shout out to PETA for all the, the legwork they had put in to to building that relationship with Miss Loretta Gray and helping uh, her platform for ending fur and, and cultivating that, you know, that he shared with us that PETA played a big role in that. But, you know, it's not enough to have a champion. It's not enough to have a good idea. Uh, we needed to draft a bill and draft legislation. And so that's where we worked with the Humane Society of the United States and our friends at GW Law and the Animal Welfare Project. There might even be some of you on this call now. Shout out to y'all. And uh, this, this is really important that you have solid language, right? Because A, you don't want the bill to pass and then be overturned uh, in the courts because you have shoddy language. And B, you don't want the, the court to overturn the bill language and have that set precedent for, for other, you know, for future laws that makes it more difficult to pass for legislation. So, you know, we worked with some great legal experts to draft some language. We, Council Member Gray introduced the bill, it was great. And it was referred to committee and like the ivory bill before, it is still in committee. We're having difficulty moving it forward. And so one of the big conversations we're having right now is as DC has a, a big citywide conversation around public safety, where there's a lot of concern around public safety, the, the, there's, there's concern that the optics of passing fur is kind of a lower priority issue. The optics of animal rights is not as important when, you know, people are getting harmed, which is, you know, totally valid. And I don't want to take away from, you know, other people's concerns in our advocacy. Our main message is, you know, and we had to do this with, with the Ivory Bill too. This, you know. Walk, you got to be walk, able to walk and chew gum as legislators. And, you know, the, the, passing this doesn't take away from any public safety initiatives. So we're still very much working on this. It's still very much stuck in committee. I want to open this up to you all. If you have ideas for ways we can get this bill moving and continue pressing for uh, the passage of a fur sales ban in D.C. and anywhere. And but I'll share with you one creative way that we've pursued uh, um, we've pursued advocacy. And th this is really stepping outside the box of traditional advocacy. So next slide. And what, what we're trying to do here is find a way to bring people together in a fun and encouraging setting, right? Not just make, demand people that, we, that they care about these values of animals, 
but but bring people into the fold in a fun way. And so we put on a fashion show last year. And, you know, our, our top goal of the fashion show was the political engagement, right? To get DC politicians to show up and attend the fashion show and have fun and get be more engaged and bought in. And we didn't have any success with that. We didn't, we got no politicians to show up. However, we were able to have mad success in branding of the fur advocacy, right? And so essentially, you know, this whole concept of promotion versus attraction, and we could promote our values all we want, but it doesn't mean they're going to be heard and doesn't mean they're going to be internalized by the general public, especially, you know, we, we don't need to convince the animal advocates. We need to convince people who maybe are adjacent to this world. And so how do we attract them to it? How do we attract them rather than promote this idea? And, and how do we draw them in? And so this fashion show was tremendously successful at drawing people in. And, you know, what we did was, um, and, and a big audience here was a sustainable fashion community. And when we first worked with Councilmember Gray to introduce the Fur Products Prohibition Act, I thought the sustainable fashion community was going to jump on board with this with delight. I was wrong. I was wrong. So what I found, and I've gotten really involved in the sustainable fashion community since then, I, I actually became a, uh, an ambassador for a, a sustainable fashion group called Remake. And what I found is that, you know, one of the principal priorities of sustainable fashion is the elimination of plastic, which is great and which is something I practice very much in my own life. However, a lot of people feel like the elimination of fur could lead to the, the incorporation of more plastic, right? The elimination of fur means more people buying synthetic furs and fur is a natural fiber. So, you know, this is of course a false duality, right? Just because we're getting rid of fur, animals used for fur doesn't mean that people need to buy more plastic, okay? And secondly, it really obviates and obscures the fact that fur has a humongous carbon footprint, way bigger than all the other major textiles, because with fur, you're feeding animals other animals. So it's extremely resource intensive, right? These foxes and minks, they're carnivores, right? So they're eating other animals. So it has a huge carbon footprint. Nonetheless, uh, you know, this is a this is a conversation we're having. And so, you know, rather than continue battling and duking out values within the sustainable fashion community, I wanted a, a context to just show off what sustainable fashion can look like without using animals, without har causing harm to our animal friends and to other species. And that is sustainable, sexy, and cool, right? And so... So that was a whole idea behind the fashion show. And we, we even used a whole pollinator for theme for the, the show. So we called the show Metamorphosis, talking not just about the evolution of the butterfly or the, the, the caterpillar to butterfly, but the evolution of, you know, unsustainable fashion into this new era that cares about our planet, that cares about the animals and the other species. And part of that was that we used a plant called milkweed floss. That was like one of our feature materials. That was so cool. So, you know, you you may know that milkweed is the only plant that monarch butterflies can use to lay their eggs. And so by, by growing milkweed to use for fabric, it not only helps create more butterfly habitat, and it's cool because you can, you can let the, the monarchs, as you know, they're migratory insects, you can let the monarchs lay their eggs on the milkweed and then move on, migrate onward. Uh, and then and then you harvest the floss after the the migratory process. And the so so we we featured milkweed floss and, and what's cool about the fiber is that it's actually warmer than down, right? So it's a plant-based material that's more sustainable, it's regenerative and it's warmer than the animal product alternative, which is just ludicrous that we're not using it across the board, right? So, so that was really cool. And, you know, just as a sidebar, as we move into society that cares more about insect welfare and thinks more about the trade-offs around the massive number of insects that could be killed, uh, pollinators like monarchs and other butterflies are just such an, a fantastic, charismatic insect that everybody cares about and everybody loves. So it's so fun to center the show around the, the butterflies and the monarchs. And of course, you know, we really try and be an intersexual organization. So we use this as an opportunity to leverage, uplift, and platform BIPOC designers and professionals in the in fashion industry. You know, lots of designers from DCs, uh, from the DC area community, and um, and as you'll see in a second, we had models uh, of lots of different origins and identities. So without further ado, I hope y'all are ready to see some uh, see. 
to take a walk down the runway. All right, let's hit it. So here you can see, you know, some of the models that we had that were just so fierce and so bold and just amazing at putting on these, these wonderful outfits, totally vegan, totally plant-based, totally sustainable. And, you know, we had three different designers featured who were all phenomenal. We had uh, one who was kind of an art clothing designer, one who was uh, entirely a secondhand line, and then the third who did the use of the milkweed floss. And, you know, as you can see, we had different ages. Not all the models are featured here. And we had, you know, different generations represented, different body types, different ability statuses, different eth ethnic and racial identities. It was just so fun. And, and y'all can see the crowd uh, lining up and it was standing room only, it was packed. People loved it. The music was great. Uh, we had a wonderful MC uh, who's a local influencer, a sustainable in influencer. We had um, the famous influencer, Jamie Logan, who's been a big voice for vegan activism as a model. And uh, beyond that, we also got to feature some very cool, sustainable faux fur coats. So. If you can click to the next uh, slide here, you can see these two models, our friends at Farm Animal Rights Movement, uh, showing off these two coats that are from Mason Atiyah, our friends at Mason Atiyah, which is a brand that does these high-end faux fur coats. It was so cool to have them walk the runway and show that, hey, we don't need fur to, to be fashionable and we don't need to harm animals. And it was so great to, to pave the road and just paint this picture of what sustainable and compassionate fashion can look like. So, uh, you know, we have a quick video of what the fashion show looked like and can give you all a little rundown with that video. John, I cannot tell you how amazing this is. This is such a moment for me. I've been dreaming of this for two years. Yeah, thanks for showing that. And I mean, boy, I was just so proud of everybody who worked on that show, the designers, the models, and everybody behind the scenes. It was super fun. And it just really enshrined for me how I I love parties as an advocacy tool. And really, I just want to party my way to animal liberation and bring people into the fold through these really fun and engaging events. So happy to answer questions. Thank you so much for World Animal Protection for having me on here. Uh, thank you so much, Max and Kate. Um, Kate, you can come on screen, but uh, speakers can stay muted. Uh, we're going to move to questions. So it looks like we already have a few questions in the chat box. This first one's for Kate. Um, for the countries that are have banned or transitioned to other industries, what um, what are the new farming practices they're doing? Like, what did these farmers transition to? So a lot of what I've heard that mink farms have transitioned to tend to be greenhouses. Mink are kept in these very, very long sheds and uh, those buildings, the design of them are well suited to be places where crops are grown, you know, fruits, vegetables, flowers. Um, I know that British Columbia, Canada, um, the government actually provided a training program for mink farmers as they were transitioning out of the industry. 
in how to turn their farms into greenhouses and how to be successful um, in that new business. I've also heard a few anecdotes of other farms that took creative approaches, um, including one who turned that long shed into a bed and breakfast pancake house. So there are lots of options. Awesome, oh, very interesting. Um, let's see, the next one is for Max. Um, can you just tell us a little more about what it's like running DC Voters for Animals and then for people who wanna pass laws in their own city or county, can they do that without the help of a big group or a group like yours? Can you just share more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I feel like as animal advocates, we so often overlook the political element of change. And, uh, you know, we are, we, we have a huge opportunity to make systemic change through the legal process. And the, the challenge with that is that it has to be incremental change, right? We're not going to ban meat overnight, right? We're not going to pass a, a meat tax uh, tomorrow. But so we have to kind of take this stepwise approach of finding ways to, to get into the hearts and minds of the, the communities we live in and the cities and, and municipalities we live in. And that's what I love about passing laws is that it's not only an opportunity to protect, protect animals, but it's an opportunity to have a, a conversation with your community about caring for animals. So, you know, a great place to get started if you're looking for more of this is to uh, check in with the Humane Society of the United States. They have a Humane Policy Volunteer Leader Program. Um, I'm, I'm a HPVL, so I think I saw another one on here from Chicago, so shout, shout out. And, you know, that's a great pro program to plug into politics and just they're good about getting people um, uh, more uh, up to speed on how to engage in the political process for animals. And then generally just get more involved in your, your political process. Start asking your candidates questions about how they think about animals. I found a lot of, it's interesting in DC, a lot of candidates they never think about animal issues. Before DC voters for, for animals came around, they never, it never crossed their minds. And then, but the fact of the matter is that they all care about animals in some respect, right? Every, every candidate we spoke with pretty much has a connection to an animal in some regard, whether it was a, a pet rabbit or a dog they adopted when they were a kid or whatever. They're, they're, it's about finding that foot in the door and building upon that connection. Thank you. Um, and following up on that, someone else, I'll answer this question. Someone was asking about um, HSUS's work um, on a Chicago ban of fur sales. And um, yes, um, Kate and I are in coalition calls, um, and we're definitely supporting um, supporting efforts like that, where HSUS is leading or where different groups leading in different cities. And I know, as Max already spoke, um, he's received a lot of support. So yes, we're definitely all working in coalition on these issues. Um, but uh, back to the speakers, I have another question for Kate that I think is really interesting. Um, so do we know the locations of all the mink farms in the U.S.? And then, like, how does that play out? Is there going to be more political opposition in those states? And kind of how do we address that? Um, we don't know the exact location of all mink farms. That data doesn't exist. Um, and this industry tends to be fairly secretive. Um, there are some mink farms that are more public and are searchable online. Um, also, USDA does a survey of mink farms every year. That's where I got that chart that was in my presentation um, and gives sort of a general picture of the regions of the country that these farms are in. Um, I can drop a link in the chat to the most recent uh, release of that survey, which was from last July. And these farms tend to be located in the upper Midwest to the West. Um, the two top mink producing states are Utah and Wisconsin. And so there does tend to be some political will in those states to protect the industry. But I think as with anything, as an industry declines, as uh, the majority of the public makes it very clear that this isn't a product or an industry that they want um, or that they're interested in supporting, uh, that you know will also result in a drop off in political will to protect that industry. Thanks, Kate. I, and I have another question for you, um, kind of related to these on these mink farms. So I think we might have a difficult answer. Um, what will happen to the minks in these U.S. farms? Are there mink sanctuaries? 
There's not an easy answer to that. Unfortunately, if the Mink Virus Act were to pass and mink farms were to be phased out over a one year period, um, the mink on, that are currently on those farms would be killed and their pelts would be sold. Um, the life cycle of mink on a farm is a year. They're um, bred in the early spring. They are allowed to grow for about six months and then they're killed toward the end of the year. And so that phase out period means that that one last cycle of breeding and killing mink would occur. The farmers would get the profits from that, but then they would not be allowed to breed more mink after that. Um, there aren't, to my knowledge, any mink sanctuaries, certainly not that could take that many mink. And um, taking animals from farms is a much more difficult political calculation than simply ending the industry after a period of time. Thanks, Kate. Um, turning to the faux fur issue, I, I think both of you maybe could answer this. Let's start with Max. What do you think about wearing faux fur? Um, I think this is something animal advocates have thought about for a long time. Does sending faux fur send the wrong message? Are we because pe people might think it's real fur? So, like, how I, I feel like everyone has a different answer. But how do how do you address wearing faux fur, Max? Yeah, I actually totally support the comment. I I 100 lift that up. That you know, faux fur is. Uh, we don't we don't need faux fur right we don't need uh we definitely don't need animal fur and so um you know the the show that i put on i really wanted to bring people into the fold who are not animal advocates but that being said i think it's really worthwhile to just be moving on from anything that even resembles animal products from the get-go um it's always a balancing act. You, you know, the more that the public sees us as austere and demanding as animal advocates, the less, the little less folks are going to want to participate. And, you know, in terms of thinking of the diffusion of innovation curve of, you know, the three and a half percent innovators, and then you get the early adopters, and then the late adopters and the laggards. You know, you're you're gonna you're gonna shift people away from that the more stringent your criteria are. But that being said, we don't want to compromise our values in uh as animal advocates and we don't want to compromise the path to liberation for animals so i definitely think it's worthwhile having that conversation and thinking about ways that we can shift off of anything that even looks like it's coming from animal products thanks Matt. Add, oh yeah kate could you expand sorry, on that i was going to add one more yeah. thing to that i agree with everything max just said and i also think that um a way to be really effective in your fashion advocacy is that if you do wear faux fur or if you're an influencer and you're posting about it online to be really really vocal about the fact that it's faux fur um for example I, I don't know how many of you have seen lately on social media that there is a trend going around of dressing like a quote-unquote mob wife um this has to do in large part with wearing what looks like fur coats and i have been really proud of the social media influencers who have um, done this trend, but have been loud and proud about the fact that they're doing it using faux fur and the brands of faux fur that they love um, and making sure that people know that they're cruelty free and it's really important for everyone else to shop that way as well. Yeah, thanks, uh, Kate and Max. Um, Okay, wow, we have a lot of questions. So unfortunately, we're not going to um, get to all of them, but I really appreciate how excited this crowd is. Um, I have one more, yeah, following up on that, Kate, can you, Max touched on this, but can you speak a little bit more about um, sustainability? It's not just even faux fur, but sustainability of these other fashion products that are coming up now. Absolutely. Um, I think Max did an effective job of, of touching on that. Um, it's definitely the case that fur farming is a resource intensive industry. Um, there's air pollution, there's, uh, you know, the release of greenhouse gases from both the animals themselves and from all the transportation that's involved. Um, there's no way to do factory farming without having a serious impact on the environment, not to mention after the animals are killed, the chemicals that are used to um, tan and cure those pelts. Um, and so I think that while there is no environmentally friendly way to 
farm fur, there is an environmentally friendly way, at least comparatively, to produce faux fur. Um, there are so many innovative fashion brands now that are producing uh, these materials from plants and that are biodegradable and that are just leaps and bounds beyond what I think people pictured in the early days of fake fur, which was more plastic based. Um, and so I think, you know, just a quick search online and you're going to find some of these really incredible innovators and designers um, that are not only helping animals, but also protecting the environment. Thanks, Kate. Um, looking into the future, um, Max, what are you most hopeful? What, what would you like to see happen in the next five years with the fur industry or animals in fashion generally? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And uh, let me start by just building off of Kate's response and say that if you are a person who cares about sustainable fashion, if you are into the sustainable fashion world, I encourage you to get involved with your sustainable fashion community because it is a huge blind spot in sustainable fashion that they are not, in, by and large, thinking about animal welfare. They're not thinking about animal interests. And so, um, you know, if you're a person who likes engaging in diplomatic conversations and, and finding ways to help people see how animals do fit into their values, I encourage you to get involved in sustainable fashion. And, and I think that's a big way that we can make an impact in the next five years. Otherwise, I see this as being one of the industries that we can make a huge dent in, uh, in, in the foreseeable future. I feel so optimistic about what we can do with fur, and there's just so much momentum going in the direction of animal protection. Thanks, and Kate, what are you hopeful for? I'm hopeful that within the next five years, mink farming in the United States will be a thing of the past. This is such an urgent problem to solve not just because these mink are suffering and dying every year and it's heartbreaking, but also because any new outbreak of one of these respiratory diseases on a mink farm, any day or month or year that this happens is, you know, creates the potential for it to jump over to people in a really dangerous form and to perpetuate the current pandemic or usher in the next one. And we know the human costs, we know the financial and economic costs of a pandemic. We have lived through one, it has been horrible. And there is just no time to waste to end mink farming. So I think that people will really wake up to that in the next five years and that we'll get that done. Well, thank you both. Um, we're gonna wrap it up now. Um, Mackenzie, could you please drop our program's email into the chat? Because I know we didn't get everyone's questions. We have way more questions than we have time, but you can feel free to email us and we will try to um, send you in the right direction or answer it ourselves. Um, and thank you to Max and Kate. I wanted to end on that hopeful note because I'm really excited about what both of them said. <laughs> um, and with that, um, I will just say um, thank you so much for joining us today, and um, you can send a message to your legislators in support of the Mink Virus Act using the QR code on the screen um, or using um, AWI's link, and you can become a World Animal Protection supporter by using the link in the chat. Um, so with that, we will close the session, and I hope to see you at our next webinar. <laughs>